Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Within the shadowy stories of Jewish teachings and folklore, there are ancient tales that whisper of creatures both terrifying and fascinating. From the depths of the sea to the heart of the forest, a menagerie of supernatural beings awaits. Imagine female vampires who can shapeshift at will, or a demonic entity accompanied by an army of destructive angels. Picture a sea monster whose very breath boils the ocean or a lion whose roar can crumble city walls. The Torah and Kabbalah beliefs contain stories of the Dibbuk, a malevolent spirit that possesses the living, and the Golem, a clay creature brought to life by mystics to protect or perhaps to destroy. There's the demon Lilith, the Nephilim giants, and more to jump into your nightmares as a reader of the Old Testament and Jewish texts. These tales steeped in centuries of tradition, offer a glimpse into a world where the line between myth and reality blurs, and where the supernatural lurks just beyond the veil of our everyday existence, even creeping into the books and films we consume, regardless of what faith you proclaim. I'm Garen Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In a case that shocked Tehachapi, California, the murder of Robert Lyman unraveled into a sordid tale of open marriage, religious awakening, and deadly betrayal. What began as a seemingly random killing at a rail yard soon revealed a chilling conspiracy involving Robert, his wife Sabrina, and her firefighter lover Jonathan. It's a story of faith, infidelity, and fatal attraction. In the heart of the Bolivian Amazon, paramedic Paul Parada's routine night shift takes an extraordinary turn when he treats an injured, seven-foot-tall, pale-skinned stranger with telepathic abilities. What begins as an unusual medical emergency evolves into a close encounter of the third kind, complete with a hovering UFO and robotic alien companions. In the early hours of a June morning in 2007, a routine newspaper delivery in Raleigh, North Carolina, stumbled upon a scene that would haunt the community for years to come. The brutal murder of Jennifer Jenna Nielsen, a pregnant 22-year-old mother of two, left investigators baffled and a family shattered. Since then, the trail of evidence has gone cold and a killer is still at large, and the quest for justice continues to go unfulfilled. In the early 1900s, a charming Hungarian tinsmith named Bella Kiss concealed a horrifying secret behind his amiable facade. When authorities uncovered 24 pickled corpses in metal drums at his residence, they exposed a chilling tale of deception, murder, and possible vampirism that would haunt Hungary for decades. But the most terrifying aspect of Kiss's gruesome legacy may be that, despite an intense manhunt, the Vampire of Sincota vanished without a trace, leaving the world to wonder if he truly escaped justice or if his dark practices granted him an unnaturally long life. But first, the world of Jewish folklore is chilling, with nightmarish creatures lurking in the shadows, from vampiric estries and demonic agrat batmalat to the colossal leviathan and the mysterious giants called Nephilim. Jewish teachings and beliefs are full of supernatural beings that have not been satisfied to only haunt the Torah, 
many have made their way into the world at large, invading our literature and even pop culture. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Folklore and traditions can be wild, captivating, thrilling, enigmatic, and enchanting. Yet one prevalent approach to storytelling is through the spine-chilling. Humans possess a fondness for being scared, and Jewish folklore courageously delves into narratives of monstrous entities within the shadows of the night, the depths of the sea, and the heart of the forest. Some of these creatures are cultural counterparts of well-known beings like vampires, genies, and demons, albeit with unique and hair-raising variations. Within Jewish folklore lie numerous demons and mythical beings that resonate in contemporary culture, likely recognizable from literature or cinema. Some entities may be unfamiliar, potentially prompting a wish to remain oblivious of their existence. Further exploration into Jewish mysticism via Kabbalah or dedicated study of Talmudic texts may reveal more insights, with this list serving as a promising starting point. Estries Female vampires known as estries who targeted Hebrew citizens derived their name from the French term strix, meaning night owl. These alluring beings were indiscriminate in their attacks. According to the Sefer Hasidim, a religious text recounting Jewish traditions in medieval Germany, estries were said to have been created on the first Friday but remained unfinished as God rested on the Sabbath. Another belief suggests that they were formed at the Tower of Babel and possessed the ability to fly by anointing themselves with special oils. Estries could be subdued by grasping their hair, compelling them to swear an oath or by physical force. If struck directly, an estuary could only recover by consuming bread and salt belonging to their attacker. They also had the ability to shapeshift into different forms to deceive others. Despite unclear methods of recognition, there are numerous accounts of individuals identifying estuaries even in disguised forms and successfully dispatching them. Agrat Bat Malat Agrat was a Talmudic demon accompanied by a legion of 180,000 destructive angels known to strike on Wednesday and Sabbath nights. While occasionally associated with the demon Lilith, whom we will cover in a few minutes, Agrat Batmalat has distinct references in the Bible. This demon is believed to have born from Asmodeus after mating with the slumbering King David. Agrat predominantly targets men, especially those who are asleep, and is often likened to a succubus in various sources. Encountering her is not an experience many men would welcome, with strong admonitions advising against sleeping alone on the nights she is active. In the legendary woods known as Biolae, it is said that a lion named Tigris resides, whose sheer size allows for a span of nine cubits or roughly 14 feet or 4.3 meters between its ears. Legend has it that when the Roman Emperor Hadrian requested Rabbi Joshua ben Hananiah to reveal to him this monstrously large lion, the rabbi, recognizing the creature's extraordinary nature, attempted to dissuade him. Nonetheless, Hadrian persisted, and from a distance of nearly four miles or 6.4 kilometers, the lion's mighty roar echoed through the land. The repercussions were dire as all pregnant women nearby suffered miscarriages and the walls of Rome crumbled. 
Drawing one mile closer, the lion let out another deafening roar, causing the teeth of all Roman men to fall out and prompting the emperor to tumble from his throne. The lion is undeniably a fearsome creature one would hope never to encounter. Fortunately for Emperor Hadrian, the rabbi possessed the ability to pray for the lion's departure, and thus it returned to its domain. The Leviathan is an enormous sea creature renowned for its indestructibility. Originally there existed a pair, a male and a female, however the female was slain by God to prevent their reproduction and the potential destruction of the world. According to Jewish belief in Olam Haba, or the world to come, it is said that the Leviathan will one day be served as a meal. When the Leviathan is hungry, it emanates heat from its mouth, causing the surrounding waters to boil, while its eyes emit a powerful light even above the water's surface. The Leviathan's only known fear is of tiny worms known as kilbit, which attach to its gills and prey on large fish. These worms are exceedingly small and challenging to locate, therefore it's wise to keep your distance from the Leviathan. Lilith is a Jewish folkloric figure who has gained increasing popularity. She was believed to pose a significant threat to pregnant women and infants, a perception largely influenced by her origin tale. According to folklore, Lilith is considered to have been Adam's initial wife formed from clay alongside Adam prior to the creation of Eve from Adam's rib. Legend has it that she defied Adam, spoke the name of God, often symbolized by the four letters YHWH or Yahweh, and was cast out of the Garden of Eden. Her name is briefly mentioned in the book of Isaiah as well as in the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically in a hymn utilized for exorcisms. In contemporary interpretations, Lilith now embodies more feminine ideals rather than being associated solely with malicious acts towards infants. Her narrative portrays her as leaving Adam due to his oppressive and domineering nature, seeking independence. Allegedly, she absconded to the Red Sea where she supposedly gave birth to around a hundred demon offspring per day and vowed to oppose both Adam and eventually Eve. By breaking free from Adam's control and evolving into a formidable female figure in her own right, Lilith has come to symbolize values such as equality, independence, and sexual liberation. Assuming you ignore the whole giving birth to demons thing. Shedim are a type of spirits or demons in Jewish folklore distinguished by their unique characteristics from how demons are described in Christian or Muslim beliefs. Over time, they evolved to be perceived as a somewhat less negative manifestation of jinn, akin to genies. Shedim are occasionally identified as other gods, small g, distinct from the God of Israel, capital G, and inherently associated with evil. Although mentioned in the Bible only twice, their portrayal is consistently negative, as seen in Deuteronomy 32.17, which mentions how, quote, they sacrificed to devils and not to God to gods whom they knew not, that were newly come up, whom their fathers worshipped not." Unquote. Shedem depicted in plural form as devils and gods whom they knew not eventually resembled the Arab jinn in characteristics, being vulnerable to iron weapons and exhibiting malevolent traits, unlike the fallen angels in the Christian tradition. In some Kabbalistic practices, Rituals involve glimpses into the future through intricate steps, where Shedim are regarded as less malevolent and more inclined to assist the practitioner performing the ritual. Dibix Creatures from Jewish folklore believed to take possession of individuals often cited as the cause of mental illness. According to legend, a dibik is formed when a person passes away, burdened by numerous sins, and roams the earth until it finds a living body to inhabit. Removal of a dibik entails a rabbi conducting an exorcism accompanied by ten men clad in burial garments. Crucially, the rabbi must ensure the dibik exits through the gap between the nail and skin of the big toe to prevent harm to the host's body. The tale of the dibik gained popularity through the 1916 film Der Dibik, a Yiddish drama recounting the creature's story. 
More recently, an auction on eBay featured a Dybbuk box, a wine cabinet supposedly housing a Dybbuk that brought nightmares and misfortune to its owner. The seller, Kevin Manis, fabricated an elaborate narrative about the box's origins, later revealing it to be a creative writing experiment. Golems Not to be confused with Gollum from The Lord of the Rings, Golems are beings formed from clay or other lifeless materials with the purpose of aiding a distressed community during challenging circumstances. These creatures are believed to be created solely by Jewish mystics, well-versed in Kabbalah, illustrating their profound expertise. Despite being intended for assistance, Golems in many instances have been known to bring about more trouble than relief. Rabbi Judah Lowe of Prague once fashioned a golem to safeguard the Jewish population in Prague from anti-Semitic assaults. However, its increasing aggression led to its eventual destruction. Legend has it that the golem still rests within the attic of the Altna Shul in Prague, awaiting a future call to duty. The nature of the golem's violence remains ambiguous, yet this act of creation by a man draws parallels to God's formation of humanity. While God may have initiated the human race, individuals possess the liberty to exercise both benevolence and malevolence, akin to golems created with the intent to rectify dire circumstances that often exacerbate the severity and dreadfulness of those situations. And the last on our list, Nephilim. The Nephilim, giant beings predating Noah's flood, are offspring of the Watchers, heavenly messengers dispatched by God to convey divine messages, who interbred with mortal women. The Nephilim stand as a contentious subject within organized religious circles, albeit an immensely intriguing one, so we'll look a little closer at the Nephilim specifically later on as the last story in this episode of Weird Darkness. Coming up, in a case that shocked Tehachapi, California, the murder of Robert Lyman unraveled into a sordid tale of open marriage, religious awakening, and deadly betrayal. What began as a seemingly random killing at a rail yard soon revealed a chilling conspiracy, including faith, infidelity, and fatal attraction. Plus, in the heart of the Bolivian Amazon, paramedic Paul Piranha's routine night shift takes an extraordinary turn when he treats an injured, seven-foot-tall, pale-skinned stranger with telepathic abilities. What begins as an unusual medical emergency evolves into a close encounter of the third kind, complete with a hovering UFO and robotic alien companions. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. On 
On August 17, 2014, Robert Lyman was shot dead at his job at the BNSF rail yard in Tehachapi, California, in a crime scene staged to look like a botched robbery. In fact, that's initially what investigators thought it was. As they began to dig into the case, however, they found a twisted web that could have been ripped from the screens of any number of political procedural TV shows featuring Bible verses justifying murder, poisoned pudding, open marriages, and a love triangle gone murderously wrong. Robert and his wife Sabrina were described by friends and family as an it couple, known for the booze-fueled parties they often threw for their closest friends who they called the Wolf Pack. According to former Kern County detective Tommy Robbins, Robert was well-liked by everyone and no one could imagine any reason why someone would want to kill him. Yet someone did. In 2008, Robert and Sabrina decided to spice up their love life by exploring an open marriage. They went on adult vacations, Sabrina's sister later told 2020. They partied a lot at the North Lake. During this time, according to her sister, Sabrina grew tired of being in an open marriage. She tried to convince her husband to go back to church, and she was drinking so much all the time that she was pretty numb. Then something changed. Sabrina was working part-time at Costco when she met Jonathan Hearn. He was a firefighter who swept Sabrina off her feet, according to ABC News. The two bonded over their shared Christian faith and began having an affair behind Robert's back. When he eventually discovered intimate texts on his wife's phone, Robert Lyman demanded that Sabrina put an end to the affair. But she didn't. Instead, according to Hearn, they hatched a deadly plan. Hi, God, Hearn can be heard saying during a conversation between the couple after detectives wiretapped their phones in the wake of Robert's murder. We're on our knees for a reason. We have been dirtbags, we've been sinners, we have been selfish, and we sinned. Initially, however, authorities were unaware of the affair or even of the existence of Jonathan Hearn. It was only as they began trying to track down figures seen on security camera footage around the time of the murder that they were alerted to the affair. Jason Bernatine, a friend of the Lyman family, received a strange voicemail from Hearn, who seemed very apologetic for Rob's death. This was the tip that led investigators to Hearn, who was later identified as a figure on a motorcycle in security footage immediately prior to Robert Lyman's murder. Once Hearn was arrested, he struck a plea deal in exchange for testifying about Sabrina's involvement in her husband's murder. According to Hearn, while he was the one who pulled the trigger, his lover had helped him plan the crime in detail. Hearn said that he had pleaded with Sabrina to divorce her husband, but she had said that he would honestly rather be dead than divorced and that losing her would essentially kill him. From there, the plot to end Robert Lyman's life was set into motion. Their goal was to slay Robert Lyman so that Hearn and Sabrina could be married, making him the stepfather of her two children with Robert who could then be raised by godly parents. In fact, according to Hearn, the successful shooting wasn't even the first such attempt. He claimed that the couple had previously planned to poison Robert Lyman's banana pudding with arsenic, but hadn't gone through with it. When that failed, he said, Sabrina provided him with Robert's work schedule and a layout of the facility where he would be working on the day of the fatal shooting. Robert rarely worked at the Teapache Rail Yard, and when he did, he was usually alone. Located some 85 miles from his home, it was an unlikely spot for an ambush. But according to documents from an appellate trial in Sabrina's case, that was exactly the reason it was chosen. Sabrina allegedly knew that Robert would be working there that day, that he would be by himself, and she provided Hearn with the information so that he could carry out the execution. Sabrina, for her part, pled not guilty to all of the charges against her. Testifying in her own defense, she denied the poisoning plot and claimed that she had no knowledge of Hearn's plans to murder her husband, or that he had done so. When confronted with wiretap evidence that showed she had called Hearn on a burner phone to warn him about new information in the investigation, she claimed that she simply told her lover what was going on, because he wanted to know. I trusted him, she said. He told me that, you know, just the dangers of what could happen when an affair is exposed, how the police think and how they work. The jury didn't buy it, however, and in February of 2018, 
Sabrina Lyman was convicted of first-degree murder, attempted murder, solicitation of murder, and conspiracy, and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. She continued to deny the allegations, and an appeal was filed. But as recently as January of 2023, the California Supreme Court denied a petition to review her conviction. For now, Sabrina Lyman remains behind bars at the California Institution for Women in Chino, California. Due to his plea deal, Hearn received a lighter sentence. Rather than murder, he was charged with manslaughter and convicted to 25 years and four months. With its sordid details of infidelity, open relationships, religious motives, and so much more, the case drew national media attention, inspiring an episode of Dateline and at least one true crime book. The swinging lifestyle of the It couple, Sabrina's religious objections, and the love triangle that ultimately led to her husband's murder often threatened to overshadow the details of the crime itself and the victims it left behind including Robert and Sabrina's two children. As of today, both Sabrina Lyman and Jonathan Hearn remain behind bars for the murder of Robert Lyman. She will potentially be eligible for parole in 2033. The September 2019 encounter involving Paul Parada is a captivating episode that provides valuable insights into the characteristics of enigmatic, pale-skinned humanoid beings that have apparently been visiting Earth for numerous decades, if not centuries. During this incident, not only did Parada engage with a tall, white alien entity, he also tended to a severe injury sustained by the entity. This encounter reveals distinctive features that align with other documented encounters, not only involving tall white humanoids, but also other presumed extraterrestrial beings. These characteristics include telepathic communication and garments crafted from an unfamiliar material. This account garnered public attention through the efforts of esteemed UFO and humanoid researcher Albert Rosales who has diligently studied and catalogued various encounters with humanoid entities. The specific event transpired one evening in September 2019 in the Amazon region of Bolivia. Parada, a 30-year-old paramedic, had volunteered in the area to provide medical aid to local firefighters injured during the wildfires that afflicted the region at the time. Late into the night, at approximately 11 p.m., while Parada was smoking a cigarette, outside the medical tent where he was stationed, he noticed a figure approaching him from the darkness enveloping the surroundings. As the figure drew nearer, he observed its distinct features more clearly. The tall figure with particularly white skin was donned in a shiny blue one-piece suit with silver stripes, completed by long blonde hair. For those versed in UFO and alien lore, this description aligns with encounters of humanoid beings known as Nordic aliens in the 1950s. While whether this mysterious figure is truly a Nordic alien remains uncertain, it is a noteworthy detail. As the figure drew closer, just a few feet away, Parada noticed he held a blanket or a towel over his shoulder. Upon inquiring if assistance was required, the figure surprisingly responded in flawless Spanish, conveying his need for help due to an injury. Subsequently, the enigmatic being made way into the medical tent, with Parada trailing close behind. Within the tent, Parada inquired about the nature of the injury, prompting the figure to unveil a significant wound on his side concealed by the towel. Parada promptly attended to the injury, observing that despite the severity and blood loss, the figure's attire remained unstained, resistant to the blood akin to waterproof material. While treating the wound, he inquired about the cause of the injury. To his surprise, instead of verbal communication, the figure utilized telepathy to convey the message directly into his mind. The figure revealed being injured by a young puma in the forest. Observing Parada's shocked expression, the figure reassured him via telepathy, emphasizing that no harm would befall him. After successfully treating the wound, the evening took an unexpected turn. Expressing gratitude for the care received, 
The figure informed Parada of feeling weak but prepared to depart. Requesting Parada to accompany him outside, the figure cautioned him about what he was about to witness. Exiting the medical tent, Parada was astonished to see a large, metallic, disc-shaped object hovering nearby with two humanoid figures underneath. These beings differed from the one treated by being shorter, with pale green skin, moving in a peculiarly mechanical manner. Parada experienced an inexplicable sense of dread when looking at these shorter figures, reminiscent of encounters with apparent robotic aliens documented elsewhere. The humanoid was approached by the figures, who departed with him. Prior to leaving, the humanoid turned to Parada and addressed him by name, information which Parada had not disclosed during the encounter. Startled and unsettled by the entire event, Parada went back inside the medical tent without witnessing the humanoid entering or exiting the craft. While Parada shared the encounter with his brother, who also happened to be in the same region, he chose to keep it to himself otherwise. He claimed to have experienced difficulty sleeping for several months following the incident, indicative of its profoundly surreal nature. Notably, Parada asserted that he possessed a piece of bandage that he had used to tend to the humanoid on which traces of its blood were present. To date, there has been no DNA analysis conducted on this bandage. However, if such testing were to proceed, the encounter could potentially emerge as a momentous event in history. The identity of the humanoid entity, its origins, and its purpose for being present here remain shrouded in mystery. The account nonetheless is a compelling one. While reports of encounters with tall, white humanoids in the 1950s exist, it is worthwhile to contemplate the possibility that these humanoids may have been visiting our planet for an extended period, perhaps even for thousands of years. It may be worth our time to investigate the notion that tall, white humanoid beings have been visiting Earth not only since the 1950s but possibly since ancient times. Could it be that the tales of angels in biblical scriptures actually recount encounters with tall, white humanoid beings from the past? The descriptions of these angels do seem to suggest a possibility. They're often depicted as having luminous white skin and dressed in radiant apparel. Moreover, their actions, which include the utilization of advanced technology, hint at a futuristic prowess. For instance, the angels visiting Lot reportedly used a device to blind a hostile crowd outside his home. Is it plausible to consider whether these angels portrayed in the Bible are in reality extraterrestrial beings? Tall, white, humanoid extraterrestrials? I'm not saying that I believe it. In various ancient legends, though, there are accounts of strange visitors possessing a radiant glow described as towering over humans with pale white skin. This leads us to ponder whether the Anunnaki, too, were tall, white, humanoid entities. If this hypothesis holds true, it implies that the Anunnaki have not completely departed and might still be engaging with Earth today. Should this notion be accurate, it would have a profound impact on the past, present, and future of humanity. The encounter of Paul Parada is intriguing for various reasons. One of the key aspects of interest is the humanoid being injured and needing help, indicating that these humanoids are physical beings. Furthermore, this highlights their inherent fallibility. Considering this, if certain researchers are correct in suggesting that extraterrestrial visitors to Earth have nefarious intentions toward humanity, it signifies that we have the capability to defend ourselves and that these humanoids are susceptible to harm. While unsettling, this awareness would be crucial in the event of an attack on humanity. Nevertheless, there is scant evidence to suggest that the tall white humanoids harbor hostile intentions towards humanity. Encounters with them typically involve information sharing and efforts to enhance spiritual awareness in individuals they encounter. If their aim is indeed to aid humanity in some manner, it begs the question of their motivations and what they may seek in return. The circumstances surrounding Paul Piranha's encounter as well as the nature and motives of the tall white humanoid entities remain enigmatic. The recent occurrence of such an encounter indicates their continued presence, hinting at potential future encounters and interactions.
When Weird Darkness Returns In the early 1900s, a charming Hungarian tinsmith named Bela Kiss concealed a horrifying secret behind his amiable facade. When authorities uncovered 24 pickled corpses in metal drums at his residence, they exposed a chilling tale of deception, murder, and possible vampirism that would haunt Hungary for decades. But the most terrifying aspect of Kiss's gruesome legacy may be that despite an intense manhunt, the vampire of Sincota vanished without a trace, leaving the world to wonder if he truly escaped justice or if his dark practices granted him an unnaturally long life. But first, in the early hours of a June morning in 2007, a routine newspaper delivery in Raleigh, North Carolina stumbled upon a scene that would haunt the community for years to come. The brutal murder of Jennifer Jenna Nielsen, a pregnant 22-year-old mother of two, left investigators baffled and a family shattered. Since then, the trail of evidence has gone cold, and a killer is still at large, and the quest for justice continues to go unfulfilled. That story is up next. When Mike left his latest trucking student at the terminal, he knew that Dave was not truly gone. The smell would take a lot longer to get out of his truck's cabin. What Mike didn't know, though, is that the odor wasn't the only thing that Dave left behind. Bedbugs by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. In 2007, a tragic event unfolded in Raleigh, North Carolina, with 22-year-old Jennifer Jenna Kathleen Nielsen lost her life in a convenience store parking lot. On June 14, 2007, at 4.45 a.m., the Raleigh Police Department received a 911 call from a concerned individual who had noticed something amiss during their paper route. The caller reported an unoccupied vehicle parked in front of a newspaper box at the American Food Mart on Lake Wheeler Road. They described the scene – interior lights on, papers scattered on the ground, and no sign of the driver. The car, a gray Honda Civic with Utah license plates, seemed out of place in the early morning hours. Responding to the call, two officers from the Raleigh Police Department arrived at the scene minutes later what they discovered would lead to a case that remains unsolved to this day. Initially, investigators faced a scarcity of leads, suggesting a potential indiscriminate attack, possibly linked to a sexual predator. The tragic homicide garnered national attention for a brief period, with America's Most Wanted taking an interest in the case and USA Today running advertisements seeking information. Jenna was described by her family as a devoted mother wife and daughter with a vibrant and sociable personality. She and her husband Tim had two sons, Skylar, three, and Caden, 11 months, and were expecting their third son, Ethan, due on July 8th. The family had recently relocated from Utah, drawn by job opportunities and the welcoming community in Raleigh. All these years later, the case remains unsolved, with no arrests made. The media spotlight has long faded but the family continues to seek justice, maintaining a website called JusticeForJenna.com. That's Justice, the number four, Jenna.com. In the aftermath of Jenna's death, her husband Tim and father Kevin Blaine campaigned for the enactment of the Unborn Victims of Violence Act in North Carolina. Established in 2011, the legislation provides legal protections for unborn children in cases of violence against pregnant women. Evidence collected from the crime scene included a bloody knife found nearby, a single human hair clutched in Jenna's hand, a shattered earring, a flip-flop, two shirts, blood marks, cigarette butts, 
and a broken red vehicle light lens. The relevance of these items to the case remains unclear. Investigators are currently seeking a person of interest described by a witness, a young Hispanic male in his late teens or early twenties, approximately 5 feet 3 inches tall, weighing 120 pounds, with black hair and a long ponytail. At the time of the incident, he was wearing a dark, sleeveless shirt and loose denim shorts. A key piece of evidence is a DNA sample believed to belong to the perpetrator. This sample is being analyzed through CODIS, the FBI's national database of criminal profiles, but no matches have been identified so far. The case remains open, with the killer potentially still at large. Anyone with information related to the case is urged to contact the Raleigh Police Department at 919-227-6220, or again, you can visit justice4jenna.com. The narrative of Bella Kiss resembles a plot taken straight from a horror film. This seemingly ordinary Hungarian individual from the 1900s was responsible for the deaths of up to 24 young women, whose remains he preserved in large metal drums. Despite the enigmatic nature of his motives, various speculations have emerged about this enigmatic character. Was he akin to a vampire preying on his victims? What sinister intentions drove him to commit these repeated acts of violence? Most chillingly, what became of him in the end? Born in 1877, there exists no documented evidence in his early years foreshadowing the killer he would evolve into. It wasn't until his forties that his spree of killings began, a period during which he was recognized as an amateur astrologer and a personable individual, according to historical accounts. His skillful deception enabled him to conceal his psychopathic tendencies for an extended period. Residing in Sincota near Budapest, Hungary, Bela Kiss led the unremarkable life of a tinsmith until his monstrous actions unveiled a deeply cruel persona. Perhaps in retrospect, there were hints that could have alerted investigators. Kiss's fascination with the mystical and astrology was well known. It's plausible that the series of murders he committed may have been linked to his involvement in occult practices. Settling in Sincota at the turn of the 20th century, Kiss engaged a housekeeper named Mrs. Jakubik around 1912. During this period, he also established connections with numerous young women, some of whom would visit his residence intermittently. Many suspect that some of these women were the first victims of Kiss. Despite Mrs. Jakubik living in his house as a housekeeper, she never had prolonged interactions with these women. However, both she and several other house visitors observed a collection of metal drums that Kiss had recently begun storing in the residence. The presence of these drums prompted inquiries from the local constable. When questioned, Bella Kiss asserted that the drums were intended for storing gasoline in anticipation of the forthcoming war that he believed to be inevitable. Given the looming onset of World War I, the credibility of Kiss's explanations went unquestioned, and no further scrutiny was applied. However, with the outbreak of the war, Kiss was called to serve, leaving his house in the care of Mrs. Jakubik, including oversight of the drums. In July 1916, the Budapest police received a report from a Sincota landlord concerning these metal drums. With Kiss absent and unavailable for interrogation, and despite Mrs. Jakubik's objections, the police proceeded to open the seven drums, believing them to contain gasoline required for their operations. To their astonishment, upon opening one of the drums, the police were met with a putrid, lingering odor emanating from within. Subsequent inspection revealed the lifeless body of a woman who had been strangled. Further exploration of Kiss's residence led to the grim discovery of additional bodies within the remaining drums. In total, the police unearthed the remains of nearly 24 women. Mrs. Jakubik vehemently denied any involvement when it was evident that Kiss was responsible for the series of murders. 
she disavowed any knowledge of his actions, claiming innocence. It appeared that Kiss had initiated his killing spree years ago, and his housekeeper remained unaware. The housekeeper revealed that Kiss had mentioned a secluded secret room in the house which Mrs. Jakubik was forbidden to enter. Upon entering the secret room, the police discovered Kiss's chilling hideaway, containing books on poisoning and strangulation, along with letters indicating his correspondence with at least 74 women. The tinsmith effortlessly captivated the attention of women, being described as a handsome, tall man with wealth. He frequently hosted extravagant gatherings and entertained guests with his sharp humor. However, as authorities traced his past activities, it became evident that his enigmatic behavior originated in the early 1900s. He would often masquerade as a rich widower, placing advertisements in newspapers seeking a new spouse. His inclination toward criminal activities was apparent early on as he duped numerous women, defrauding them of their money. While his previous crimes mainly revolved around financial deception, his murderous tendencies only surfaced after his marriage to a young woman named Marie in 1912. Shortly following their union, Marie engaged in a romantic entanglement with an artist named Bikari. In 1912, Bikari and Marie went missing, with Kiss asserting that the two lovers had eloped to America. Subsequent investigations, however, revealed that Bakari and Marie were Kiss's initial victims. After the deaths of his wife and her lover, Kiss embarked on a spree of killings, attracting young women with a false persona, deceiving and ultimately murdering them, either through manual strangulation or poison. As a psychopathic serial killer, Kiss meticulously preserved his victims' bodies as macabre trophies by draining their blood to prevent decay. This gruesome practice led to Kiss being dubbed the Vampire of Sincota. He stored methanol in large steel containers to pickle the bodies in alcohol, retarding the decomposition process. The morbid trophies, combined with Kiss's captivating charm over women, fueled speculations of vampirism. One wonders if Kiss derived power from the act of killing these women and what became of the blood drained from the bodies. When authorities confirmed Kiss's crimes, an intense manhunt ensued, hampered by the chaos of the ongoing war which made apprehending Kiss a challenging task. The Budapest police enlisted military support to capture the fugitive, but at that point Bella Kiss's whereabouts remained a mystery, with assumptions of him being a prisoner of war or deceased. However, in 1914, reports reached the police indicating that Bella Kiss was recovering from a wound in a Serbian hospital. Upon the investigating officer's arrival at the hospital, Kiss had fled, leaving behind the body of a deceased soldier as a decoy on his bed. Subsequently, Bella Kiss vanished without a trace. Despite numerous efforts by the police to locate him over the years, they were unsuccessful. There were several alleged sightings of Bella Kiss in both 1920 and 1932, yet he always managed to evade capture, remaining one step ahead at all times. The ultimate fate of the notorious Bella Kiss remains shrouded in mystery. Where did he disappear to? Did he continue his reign of violence? Additionally, what truth lies behind the speculations regarding his alleged vampirism? Had Kiss survived to the present day, he would be nearly 150 years old. Any ordinary man would have succumbed to old age long ago. But if Kiss possessed a means to elude death, could he possibly still lurk in the shadows, evading detection? Up next, who were the mysterious Nephilim mentioned in the Bible? Were they giants, fallen angels, or something else entirely? We'll look at some competing theories about their origins and nature, pulling from ancient texts to modern interpretations to where they come into biblical lore. Road dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, 
brake shakers, trucklets, 18-wheelers, deadheads, yard dogs. You got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. When people think of giants in the Bible, they typically think of Goliath. But outside of him, there were other giants, and they were known as the Nephilim. Or maybe they weren't giants? The Nephilim are mighty men, described in the Old Testament, as incredibly large and physically strong. They are the children of the sons of God and the daughters of man. Nephilim is translated as giants in some versions of the Hebrew Bible but left untranslated in other versions. So does that mean we really don't know what they were? What the heck is a Nephilim? There's almost always variance when discussing the Nephilim details in Christian circles today. Is there a correct answer to who precisely the Nephilim were? Scholars and theologians find this subject fascinating. The word Nephilim is found in the Bible two times. The first is in Genesis 6 verses 1-6, through and then again in Numbers 13 verse 33. Scholars and commentators translate the word Nephilim as giants or fallen ones. Even among the most brilliant, there is debate on translating this term. One reason Nephilim is often translated as fallen ones is the relation to the Hebrew word nephal, which means to fall. One school of thought associates these beings with fallen angels or their offspring. Genesis 6 verses 1 through 6 never states that the Nephilim were giants, but it does say they were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The verse that clues us into them being giants is Numbers 13 verse 33, which states, And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. Here, Scripture indicates they were possibly giants, men much larger and stronger than usual. No one really knows exactly who or what the Nephilim were, however. Scripture gives us clues about who the sons of God and the daughters of men were in Genesis 6 verses 1-4. through For centuries, scholars from Judaism and Christianity have presented four different views on who the Nephilim were. The first view is that fallen angels had relations with the daughters of men, which resulted in a part-human, part-supernatural being, the Nephilim. The second position, held by some, is that demons or fallen angels possessed men, then had relations with the daughters of men, resulting in the Nephilim. A third position, called the Sethite view, is held by some scholars. The Sethite view defines the sons of God as the righteous line of Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve, who was born after Cain killed his brother Abel. Theory 1. Nephilim as offspring of fallen angels and human women. The view that has increased in favor today is that the Nephilim were offsprings of fallen angels and human women. It has increased in favor today, and the position is that the sons of God were fallen angels who had relations with the daughters of men Genesis 6, verses 1 through 6, and as a result, the Nephilim were born. This is the most popular view in the church today. There is support for the theory. A verse that supports this position is Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. In connection to this verse, Job 38 verse 7 also tells us, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. These verses use the same term found in Genesis chapter 6. Theologians historically have interpreted the sons of God as angels, which fit right into the context of these verses. 
One main scripture passage used to defend this view is Jude chapter 1 verses 6 through 7, which says, "And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh and set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire." The Jude 1 6-7 passage indicates there were angels that went after strange flesh. Human flesh would be strange to an angel. There is opposition to the theory, though. One pushback for this is that angelic beings don't have the DNA to combine with humans. They are spiritual beings. Therefore, it's not possible that they can produce offspring. Again, this assumes that angels can't have the same DNA as humans. Some would argue that it's possible because we see two angels take the form of humans in Genesis 19 verses 1 through 13. Who's to say they didn't carry the full reproductive capabilities at the same time? The next theory is the Nephilim were descendants of Seth. The Sethite view that the Nephilim were from the lineage of Seth is growing rapidly within the church and it's possibly the most common view today among scholars. Here, the sons of God are defined as the righteous line of Seth, Genesis chapter 5, that disobeyed God and they married women from the line of Cain. Note, some do believe these women were not exclusive to Cain's family line. The women who married the line of Seth followed other gods and rejected full allegiance to God. The offspring, as a result, fell away and turned to the system of the world. According to Jewish historical writings and literature as early as the first century, Jewish scholars have favored this view. St. Augustine and John Calvin are famous scholars and theologians who have held this position. Here we are assuming that from Seth to Noah, all the past members in the family were obedient to God to preserve a righteous lineage. Theory 3. The Nephilim were human children possessed by fallen angels. When we discuss this third view that fallen angels possessed men, it may begin to connect with some of us because we can see the reality of demonic possession in today's world. From the movies in Hollywood to witchcraft around the globe, it's real. But the heart of the question here is, are the sons of God, if human, able to become possessed? The answer? There is no evidence in the Bible to support this idea that God's children can become demon-possessed. Theory 4. Nephilim were offspring of fallen men. This last view claims that the sons of God were godly men who married ungodly women, not from the line of Seth, just common men. The result of this union was the Nephilim, a group of offspring that fell away. But there is a debate. Again, we got to go back to the fact that there is still debate as to what the term Nephilim means as it's related to the verb series to fall, which is the Hebrew word nephal. This view relies on the verb series nephal, which means fallen or to fall. This position is consistent with scripture both pre-flood and post-flood, meaning before the flood, these offspring were fallen men, and the flood, when God destroyed everybody but the family of Noah, these Nephilim are still showing up, Numbers 13 verse 33. Therefore, the Nephilim are simply fallen men. So why are the Nephilim on earth after the flood then? This is a question asked by many people. If God flooded earth, killing all mankind besides the family of Noah, how is it that Nephilim are still alive? Scholars have responded to this a few different ways. One answer to the question is the Nephilim were giants, offspring of fallen angels, sons of God, and human women, so fallen angels simply continued to reproduce with human women after the flood. Another answer would be the sons of God are fallen men. After the flood, different godly men had relations with different ungodly women and reproduced the Nephilim once again. The Book of Enoch describes angels marrying women on earth, and the offspring was a giant type of being. Enoch is not considered the inspired authoritative word of God. Jews and early Christians did hold the book, though, as a good read, meaning it wasn't fully accurate but still held nuggets of truth. Even Jesus himself quoted from it. Some say that because Enoch is quoted in Jude 1 verse 14, it should be in the biblical canon, but other writings are also quoted in scripture that are certainly not the word of God. Acts 17:28, Titus 1:12. 
When we speak of giants in the Bible and the Nephilim, we can't forget to consider the Rephaim Genesis 14, 5. One of the definitions of Rephaim, according to the Jews, is a people group of greater than average height and stature, also known as the Zamzumim. They were as tall as the Anakim, according to scripture, which are other giants in the land. Where did these giants come from? Some would argue that they can be traced back to Genesis chapter 6. I'll let you read that for yourself. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others, as well as help for other issues such as domestic abuse, sex trafficking, crisis pregnancy, and more. Even help if you're struggling to get past a paranormal event that has happened to you. That's the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. While there, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal story or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 25 verse 28. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. And a final thought. Let us rather run the risk of wearing out than rusting out. Theodore Roosevelt. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.